Thank you, Peter. So I'm going to cover three topics. I'm going to talk about Bitcoin, because everybody wants to talk about Bitcoin. Then I'm going to talk about smart contracts, because that's what I think is really interesting in this field. And then I'm going to talk about uh, cross-chain transactions and how living in a world where nobody trusts anyone means that we need to rethink our notions of correctness that uh, our ideas of distributed transactions don't really translate into this uh, world of, uh, in into the modern world. So, <clears throat> as I said in my earlier lecture, there's a lot of complication and mystification surrounding the notion of a blockchain. But really, a blockchain is only just a ledger, like this. It is a sequential list of things that happened. Now, it has a few special properties, so it's append-only. Uh, if any of you ever took an accounting class, you know that you're not allowed to go and erase something in a book. If you wa want to have a correction, you append it. And so everything that happens, you append to the end so that you can look in the past and see everything that ever happened. It's impossible to change history in, um, in an immediate sense. Uh, despite the fact that it's, a led, it's called a ledger, it doesn't have to be financial. It's really more like a database log or a file system log. It can be any kind of state machine. Uh, if you want to know the state of a machine, you start in initial state and you look at everything that happened in the order that it happened. Uh, there's a protocol where everyone agrees on the content. And uh, this is important because uh, you might not trust me, and I certainly don't trust you, but we have agreed on a protocol that's, that tells you what's in the, in the ledger. And this is the foundation for how we can do business in a world where uh, nobody really trusts anyone else. And of course, the, ledger, the protocol for the ledger has to be tamper-proof. And uh, here we're going to use a lot of crypto magic signatures and so on uh, to make sure that uh, something can't be changed retroactively. Now, um, so that's the abstraction that the blockchain is implementing. And of course, it doesn't mention blocks and it doesn't mention chains. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what, the, um, uh, what blockchains look like. Now, when you, blockchain world is a little bit different from, say, working on lock-free data structures or cache coherence protocols because it's full of people who have ideological vigor. You know, they really believe that uh, uh, blockchains are going to change all kinds of deep mystical things, and I'm not going to you know, go into that. But one of the things that people get excited about is decentralization and trust. The idea is that if we want to build a uh, financial world where corporations, governments, uh, other organizations can't control what we do, we have to be decentralized. So what does it mean to be decentralized? Well, a centralized financial system is a Visa and MasterCard. You know, I try to buy something, a Visa checks, oh, uh, you know, is my credit good? Is the merchant uh, uh, known to be honest? If, is, uh, if I try to buy something uh, here and then 30 seconds later try to buy something in Dubai, then maybe they, uh, they become suspicious. Uh, decentralized means that decisions are made, in some sense, collectively. And decentralized is viewed as being more secure because it's harder to corrupt multiple parties than it is to corrupt a single party. Now, that may or may not be true in specific circumstances, but this is the, the underlying uh, belief. So a lot of even modern distributed systems are based on centralized trust. If you look at how uh, distributed databases like Oracle uh, commit, you typically have one coordinator <coughs> who who figures out that everything is okay before committing. And you trust that coordinator, and everything is sufficient because it's uh, centralized. Now, one of the principles that blockchain believers don't like to talk about is that centralized systems tend to be inherently more efficient than decentralized systems. And a lot of systems, when left on their own, will tend to become centralized, even if that was not your intention. And we'll see some examples of that. So, in a centralized <coughs> trust system, there is one party who makes at least one important decision. And of course, the problem with this is that party might be corrupted, 
uh, that party might do things you don't like. And this is why the uh, decentralized systems have, uh, have some appeal. So in decentralized systems, a group makes the decisions. So if I want to decide uh, you know, what to have for lunch, I'll ask everyone to, to vote on this. And I'm pretty confident it would be expensive for uh, someone to bribe 51% of you. Uh, another way to put this is to say that there's no small faction that can determine the outcome. If there's a small group that can determine the outcome, then it's cheaper to bribe them. It's easier to corrupt them, easier to threaten them. So typically we want something where a lot of ind ostensibly independent agents are making the decisions. Now, question is, who gets to vote? This is what uh, determines the, in some sense, the security of the system. So in France, which I picked as a random example, uh, eight adult men were given the right to vote in 1792, and then that didn't work out too well, so they tried it again in 1848. And you know, that means that uh, if you were an adult man around that time, then you had the privilege of being able to make decisions. Uh, women got the vote in 1944, and the uh, <clears throat> only citizens are allowed to vote. So these are the rules. Now, I'm not saying you know, whether, whether the rules are good or bad, but these are the rules that determine who gets to uh, vote on the uh, system. And this is what determines in some, you know, the security and structure of your system is who it is who gets to uh, vote on the state of the ledger. Uh, one question is, how do you prove that you have the right to vote? So you can say, well, you know, you're a member of the voting class. You get one vote. How do you establish that you can do this? And so this is something called the permission model because you show I have permission to vote because I am a French citizen. Uh, as long as the adversary can't bribe a majority, then we believe that the system is fair. You know, if 51% the, the, um, of the people vote for the honest, correct answer, then we're okay. And the fact that it would be... Ex it's either too expensive or otherwise impossible to um, uh, bribe or threaten 51%. Uh, and this is pretty much how classical distributed systems work. You know, sometimes it's a third, sometimes it's a half. But basically, you establish that you have the right to vote, and this is usually not the focus of uh, much of the work on distributed computing, you know, establishing your credentials. It's how the voting works, how many rounds of voting uh, you have, and so on. Now, there's a problem, which I talked about uh, last time, you probably you know, recognize the slide, which is that establishing that you have the right to vote can be difficult. So, as I mentioned before, in the United States, if you vote, you get a little sticker with a flag. So you go to the polling place, you vote, they give you a sticker, you can put the sticker on your shirt, and you can feel morally superior to people who didn't bother to vote. And so <clears throat> what happens is something called a Sybil attack, where I might control a lot of uh, fake uh, people. And so I get to vote more than once. So I can, uh, you know, for example, if you can vote based on IP addresses, I can manufacture a million IP addresses, they can all vote on my behalf, and now I have more power than I should have. So there, there is a real uh, problem in uh, deciding how to, um, how to decide who gets to vote. So the solution that Bitcoin has is something called proof of, wor of work. And like I said at the last lecture, proof of work basically says, I'm going to prove that I am worthy of voting by burning a $100 bill. I'm going to do something that is expensive and wasteful and serves no other purpose than to establish that I can vote. And this is, in some sense, the you know, technical details aside, this is what uh, proof of work uh, you know, really means. And the idea here is, well, if you have, the original idea was you have one CPU, one vote. So I have a laptop here, that means I can vote. If I want to vote twice, I have to buy two laptops. And that's, you know, that's expensive. And in particular, if I want to control 51% of the vote, I need to own 51% of the laptops. And, uh, you know, that, and that's very expensive because it's cheap for other people to buy laptops to, to compete with me. And this is called the permissionless model because anybody can buy a laptop and anyone can vote. Uh, 
This works, again, if the adversary controls less than half of the power. So there have recently been what have been called 51% attacks, uh, not on Bitcoin, but on uh, weaker currencies that have you know, fewer participants. So it turns out that somebody noticed, well, for an hour, I can rent enough equipment to launch a 51% attack against kind of obscure uh, you know, uh, Ethereum Classic, for example, uh, blockchains. And you know, they managed to uh, steal you know, a, a pretty respectable amount of uh, money. But the premise is that you assume that it's too expensive or impractical for the adversary to control more than half of the power. And how this works was the uh, sort of breakthrough observation that um, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, whoever that was, uh, uh, produced. So uh, what the original paper says is, you know, the system is secure as long as the honest nodes collectively control more than half of the power. And it's something like the, you know, this says that if uh, people lose interest in Bitcoin, and if there are fewer miners, fewer participants, then it will be less secure because it will be easier to launch an attack. You know, we've all seen that if, you know, the fewer people that vote, uh, the more likely crazy outcomes are going to happen because smaller uh, dedicated groups can uh, cause um, uh, things, things to change. Now, um, so the claim is that Bitcoin is uh, hugely decentralized because it's permissionless. Anybody who wants to can join in. Uh, everybody can uh, participate if they want. So it would be really, really hard for a small um, group to be corrupted. A small, there's no small group that has power. But in fact, this is, this is kind of a myth. Uh, despite everything, uh, Bitcoin today is actually highly centralized, but not in obvious uh, ways. So, <clears throat> for example, the top four Bitcoin miners, uh, this was as of uh, maybe two years ago, uh, control 53% of the power. So if, if these four miners were to collude and say, we are going to rewrite everything and steal everyone's money, they could do this. Now, they're not going to do this, probably, because if they did, the value of Bitcoin would go to zero very quickly, and uh, what would be the point of stealing something that uh, goes to zero? So you can say, kind of ironically, that it's possible to trust these miners because they have a really strong interest in keeping up the value of Bitcoin and keeping things honest. Same way that your uh, banker is not likely to clear out your account and uh, fly to Brazil because uh, they can make more money by being honest than they can by stealing things. But nevertheless, this is not a decentralized uh, system. Uh, it's not just Bitcoin. Ethereum, which I'll talk about in more detail later on, is the probably, I think, the second the biggest uh, uh, currency. And th that, too, is highly centralized. So, in principle, these things are decentralized. Uh, they can't be corrupted. Uh, you know, no government or corporation can control things. Uh, but in practice, uh, this is largely, like so many things in the Bitcoin world, this is largely a myth. Uh, if you move up a little bit, uh, 15 Bitcoin miners, 11 Ethereum miners, you get more than 90% of the uh, computing power. So this is not uh, something that is, you know, despite all of the rhetoric that you hear about how blockchains and cryptocurrencies are ways of uh, escaping the control of uh, large organizations, you know, you should be skeptical of this. So let me <clears throat> talk about something a little, a slightly more technical. So I'm going to talk about how the Bitcoin protocol is structured I'm going to keep this at kind of a high level. I'm not going to try to descend into uh, you know, which bits mean what in the header, because you can all figure that out once you understand the overall uh, structure. And by looking at this overall structure, you can see, in some sense, what the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the protocol are. So we have uh, different parties have different roles. So we have clients. Clients are the hats, you know, the fedoras on top. Those are you know, regular people. Those are people who want to buy pizzas, people who want to invest in Bitcoin. You know, that's your, you know, your cousin, your grandmother, people like that. And so they create transactions. A transaction is something like buy a Bitcoin, sell a Bitcoin. And they send them to miners. Miners have uh, round hard hats. 
So the, the clients send transactions to miners. Miners are the people who actually participate in building the ledger. So the miners decide what goes on the ledger. The miners are the ones with the, with the power. <coughs> so the miners take these transactions, they collect a bunch of them, and they put them into a block. And this is the origin of the block in blockchain. You know, the block isn't logically necessary, it's there for performance. That if you, if you uh, appended one transaction at a time, that would be slow, so you typ they typically fill up a, uh, you know, a, a megabyte or so of uh, transactions in each uh, block. So we have a bunch of uh, miners. Each miner assembles its own block. Now, miners get paid if their blocks are accepted. So, each, so now the, the miners are competing with each other because each one wants their block to be accepted because otherwise they don't get paid. On the other hand, they have to cooperate because if no blocks are accepted, then nobody gets paid. So this is uh, you know, typical of this kind of a system where the participants not only don't trust each other, they're kind of adversarial, but they need to cooperate for anyone to, um, to make uh, progress. So everyone has to uh, kind of agree on the rules uh, here. So what the miners do, the miners do consensus, and they pick one block to win. And it's the nature of this consensus, which, which I talked about uh, in yesterday's uh, talk, that in some sense defines the engine room of, um, of uh, Bitcoin. You know, that's the, the, you know, the pistons and the uh, you know, intake compression, ignition exhaust part. And this is the sort of the outer structure of the Bitcoin automobile. So they pick one block, and that's the one that goes onto the, uh, onto the ledger. Now, Bitcoin is uh, by no means the first electronic currency. Electronic currencies in one form or another have been around since the 90s. Bitcoin is the first one that became popular. And the earlier versions of electronic currencies all stumbled over the question of how to deal with double spending. So in this, in this picture, uh, each of these little chips represents a, a party, a process. Uh, the, this party buys a pizza and a, um, a coffee with the same coin. So, uh, you know, I, I send uh, the Bitcoin to the pizza place, I send the Bitcoin to the coffee place, each one looks at it and says, yep, hashes work, looks like a coin to me. And then that way I get uh, two things, for, I, I've spent the same coin twice. And this is, in some sense, the central problem to building a uh, cryptocurrency and one that was very hard to solve before uh, Nakamoto's paper came along. And it says, how do you tell that somebody, if, 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 you give me, if you give me a ruble note, I'm pretty sure it's good because I can hold it up to the light. But if you send me an electronic uh, um, bill, bank note, how do I know you didn't just copy it and send it to other people at the same time? So the way the original um, schemes worked, you know, the, the way Chalm's um, um, system worked, was there was a centralized uh, server called the Mint. And the Mint would basically check. So if I wanted to buy something, I would send a message to the Mint and say, send one of my coins to the pizza place, or, or send one of my coins to the, uh, to the Starbucks. And if I told the Mint to send the same coin to the pizza place and the Starbucks, it, wouldn't, it would refuse. And so you can see this solves the problem, but it's centralized. It means you have to trust the Mint. And Again, the big breakthrough in uh, the design of Bitcoin was saying we don't need to have a centralized mint. So what uh, the Nakamoto consensus does is it says we're going to replace the mint with this distributed ledger. And before I accept a coin, I'm going to look on the ledger and make sure that, no, that it wasn't spent somewhere else. So if you want to buy a pizza from me, you put on the ledger a transaction that you transferred the, that coin to me. When I see that that transfer is on the ledger and that you haven't transferred that same coin to anyone else, then I will send you the pizza. And so this is decentralized. It's unfortunately a little bit slow, 
but it does guarantee that I'm not going to, uh, be, that nobody can double spend. Because if you do put the same, if you spend the same coin twice and put it on the ledger, then the first transfer will be honored, the second transfer will be rejected. And uh, everyone is safe. So this is, uh, this is what the original Bitcoin uh, paper you know, says about that. Now, um, in some sense, that's the main structure of um, a Bitcoin. Uh, in a while, I'll talk about smart contracts, uh, which typically run in a different uh, kind of blockchain, similar in some ways, but uh, different in, in other important ways. <clears throat> but before I do that, I'm going to um, express some opinions about uh, Bitcoin, things that you need to know. Uh, warning, not everybody agrees with this. Some people get very angry when you know, I make these, uh, these kinds of remarks. I don't think, I'm not, certainly not the only one who has these opinions, but there are people who uh, view these opinions as being kind of uh, you know, inflammatory and wrong and so on. So be careful if you want to repeat them in a bar in front of, you know, in Silicon Valley somewhere. So this is the original paper that, that defined Bitcoin. And uh, really, it's, it's a very well-written paper. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at it carefully, you know, people have looked at it carefully trying to figure out who, who wrote it. And it cleverly mixes American and British uh, spelling to throw people off. You know, I'm pretty sure the writer uh, was at least culturally American from uh, other uh, things. Uh, but we can't read it like it's still 2008. Now, you know, Bitcoin has grown and become famous, but many of the people who promote this haven't either read the paper or haven't read it recently. And if you look at it, the paper doesn't necessarily say what you think it says. Or it doesn't necessarily say what most people think it says. So, like, all, like other founding documents for ideological uh, movements, it turns out that uh, things were different. Things turned out differently from uh, the way that uh, uh, people saw the world when these things were written. So, the motivation here starts out and says, well, today, meaning 2008, commerce on the internet requires credit cards. And this is really bad. Uh, why is this bad? Because credit card transactions are reversible. You know, if I go on the internet in 2008, you know, before Amazon and so on, and I want to buy a CD, I think they still use CDs back in 2008, then I give the merchant a credit card, the merchant might send the CD, and then I could cancel, so I get the CD and my money back. And uh, this, is, this is terrible, because think about those poor merchants. Now, the paper is silent on the other side, you know, what about the um, uh, customer? You know, if I buy a CD and it turns out it's the wrong CD or it doesn't play, then uh, the paper is kind of silent on uh, what happens uh, there. So it's a very one-sided point of view. It says that credit cards are no good because Visa and MasterCard allow clients to reverse charges, which is actually a little bit simplistic. But, uh, and that mediation of the credit card companies adds to friction and inefficiency. Now, Personally, I don't really buy this. I'm grateful that if I, um, if I buy something or if somebody uses my credit card without authorization, I can go to Visa and say, hey, you know, that's illegal, give me, you know, refund that. And Visa will, uh, will, will do that if you have an honest uh, case. This is not true with cash. This is not true with cryptocurrencies. So there is a valuable service being given to, um, to customers, but none of this is mentioned in the paper. The paper is very... Um, very one-sided. Now, uh, one point that they make that's, uh, I think, quite accurate is that Visa and MasterCard have to decide whether you're trustworthy, and so for that reason, they kind of spy on you. That's why you have a credit report. You know, if you don't pay your mortgage or you don't pay your, make your car payments, then Visa will know about this and they won't give you a credit card. And they do that for their own protection, but as a side effect, we have what's called surveillance capitalism, where we have all, the, all these companies 
who know a lot about us. And other companies have, of course, taken this to new levels because they're also, they also want to know what kind of ads to send you and so on. But a lot of the loss of our privacy has to do with the fact that if you want credit from a credit card company, they have to know enough about you to know whether you're trustworthy or not. And this is a trade-off that we make. If you guard your privacy uh, really strongly, then you won't get a credit card. And so the vision of Nakamoto's vision was that Bitcoin is a credit card replacement for buying things on the internet. That if I want to buy a uh, 2008 CD and I don't want to uh, have credit card companies spying on me, then I send them Bitcoin. And if I send Bitcoin, I can't take it back. So I can't reverse the charges, I can't steal money from, I can't steal CDs from these poor merchants by canceling afterwards. And that's basically what uh, Bitcoin was invented to do. There are a few other cryptic statements about what it might be able to do that people have kind of interpreted and overinterpreted, but this is really the point of the original of Bitcoin uh, paper. <clears throat> so irreversible charges protect merchants, same way the cash does. You know, I go into a store, I put down a cash, and uh, then I can't, you know, the, unless the merchant feels like it, they don't have to give it back. You know, if I charge it on a credit card, then of course I can, I can reverse it. Uh, again, the paper is totally silent on protection for consumers. This is all about making sure that the merchants don't lose anything. The protection for the consumers doesn't show up. And indeed, there is very little or maybe no protection for consumers in Bitcoin. If you lose your key, someone steals your, your key, you've lost that money, and, uh, and that's it. You have no recourse for theft and fraud. So um, one way to think about this is to say, you know, money serves, in classical economics, money serves well, actually three purposes, but we're not going to talk about units of account. <clears throat> one thing is the medium of exchange. I can use a dollar or a ruble or a euro to go out and buy something. You know, I hand the clerk a uh, dollar, I get back, you know, a piece of pizza. The other is a store of value. That is, I can take my savings and I can uh, put them in uh, some currency and I can take, put it in the bank, I can bury it in my backyard. And then later I can withdraw it from the bank and, and take it, you know, or dig it up. And, and use it, but it's a way of taking value and storing it for a while. And typically money serves both of these purposes, but they're not the same thing. So um, for a while at least, Bitcoin was a very good store of value because you could buy it for you know, $1,000 at the start of 2017 and sell it for $20,000 at the end of 2018. So that's a, uh, you know, that's a good place to put your um, savings at that time. It's probably not such a good store of value between 2018 and, um, and now. It went from 20000 to 3000 and now it's back up to you know, you know, around 10000 But it's not a good medium of exchange. Uh, there's, there's a headline that I didn't use here which says Bitcoin conference stops accepting Bitcoins for registration. Because the problem is it was too volatile. The, uh, you know, the registration was, a, was $100 and you send a certain number of Bitcoins and if Bitcoin went up, they'd have to refund you money. If Bitcoin had gone down, then they'd have to demand more money. And it was so expensive dealing with this that the Bitcoin conference wouldn't take Bitcoins because of the volatility. And so, when you, you know, go out and, and buy coffee for your breakfast, you don't typically worry about has the price of coffee gone you know, up by 50% or down by 50% every day. You might worry about that over the course of a year, but prices tend to be stable in um, uh, regular uh, fiat money. So what this article says is that you know, Bitcoin is basically only a speculative investment. So the original vision was that Bitcoin would be a merchant-friendly credit card replacement. It was only a medium of exchange. He doesn't really mention uh, buying Bitcoin as an investment. 
because uh, the idea that its value would fluctuate uh, wildly uh, probably didn't occur to him because it wasn't, uh, you know, at, at the time there were, you know, 10 people who were mining a Bitcoin and uh, there was no way to foresee the uh, success. But today's only actual use is speculation. People buy Bitcoins expecting the number to go up. If the number goes down, then they hold on because eventually the number will go up. The um, actual price of Bitcoin, you know, there is speculation that a lot of this is uh, not, it's not a real market, that there are some big holders of Bitcoin who sell Bitcoin to themselves and drive the price up and down by, you know, creating large buy and sell orders and so on. So it, it's a uh, pretty much only a speculative instrument and as a speculative instrument, it's, it's somewhat uh, suspect. Okay, so um, that's kind of a high level survey of Bitcoin. Now I want to talk about some, a different topic in somewhat more, uh, more depth. Remind me when I'm supposed to stop. One, one more hour, okay, okay, good. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, smart contracts. Smart contracts are, I think, to, to me, one of the most interesting uh, areas of this field. Oh, by the way, I, I might sound like I'm you know, completely cynical about this, but I'm not. I think that there is a lot of really interesting scientific and engineering work in this area. I think it's obfuscated by a lot of the hype and ideology, and uh, this is why I'm trying to clear away some of the uh, fog and focus on what I think are the uh, important areas. So I'm, I'm not you know, a nihilist cynic, you know, I'm just trying to focus attention on these, you know, the core scientific challenges uh, here. And one of them is smart contracts. So a smart contract is a script that runs on the blockchain. And I'll explain uh, what that means. The first thing to explain about smart contracts are not contracts, and they're not really smart. Uh, calling it a smart contract was a brilliant marketing move because everybody remembers the name. You know, if you called it, uh, you know, shell scripts that, uh, you know, that, that run on a distributed blockchain, then nobody would get excited about it. Uh, you know, so, but the name is stuck, and I'm going to use that name, but don't be confused uh, by this. There's nothing particularly smart or, or magical about this, but it is a very interesting uh, area. And it's also an area where I think things are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to clean this area up, as, as we'll uh, see. Smart, well, smart contracts live on blockchains. I did, it was called COBOL. No, we'll, we'll see what's, uh, what's different uh, with uh, uh, smart contracts. So this is the paper that uh, describes uh, smart contracts for Ethereum, or the, the Ethereum virtual machine. It's not the world's most entertaining uh, reading, but this is uh, where uh, much of this material uh, came from. So uh, Ethereum is the second largest cryptocurrency, or at least it was uh, last time I uh, looked this up. <coughs> um, I'll explain what this means in a minute, but it has a fundamentally different model of what a ledger entry looks like than Bitcoin does. I'll explain what a UTXO is uh, in a minute. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that it's programmable via what these smart contracts. Now, Bitcoin is also programmable, but only in very limited ways. But Ethereum uh, decided being programmable money is going to be our thing. And that's what has made Ethereum as a, a huge success because you can do all kinds of complicated uh, things in Ethereum that would be either very hard or, or just not possible in, in Bitcoin. And we'll, we'll see some examples of, uh, of those as we go on. And basically, this is what's called a Turing complete language. Technically, it's not really Turing complete, and you can have you know, long entertaining arguments about whether it is or is not Turing complete, and I'll try to illuminate that a little bit uh, before. But people call it a Turing complete language. And so this is something that you'll hear, even if we can quibble with the accuracy. So Bitcoin. Each transaction is something called an unspent 
transaction output, a UTXO. So that says, uh, what can I do in a Bitcoin transaction? Well, I can have multiple inputs. I can say, take Bitcoin from here, a Bitcoin from here, and a Bitcoin from here, and send it to these other addresses. So a unit of Bitcoin, a, a, a UTXO, is like a banknote. You can't break it into pieces. When you spend it, you destroy it. So this is like saying, I'll take a 100 ruble note, a 50 ruble note, and a 1,000 ruble note, destroy them, and then uh, output them, output different denomination notes. Now, the interesting thing that you can actually do, you know, for example, if you want to order pizza, you know, one output is I send uh, some coins to the pizza merchant. The other is I uh, give change back to myself. Because maybe I collected 1,000 rubles here, but the pizza is only 700 rubles. So, uh, you know, 300, I go back to myself. And the interesting thing here is in Bitcoin, uh, you can also place certain conditions on the transfer. You can say, well, this transfer can only happen after noon tomorrow. You could say, well, this transfer can only happen if there are two signatures out of the following three. And these conditions are what in Ethereum are called smart contracts. So it's basically a kind of a guard or a predicate that you execute saying, is it okay to execute this uh, transaction? And if the program says, yes, it is okay, then you do it. And if the program says, no, it's not okay, then it doesn't uh, really happen. And again, in Bitcoin, the, these conditions are fairly rudimentary, but in Ethereum, they can be quite, uh, quite elaborate. Now, Ethereum has a different model. So instead of having nothing but unspent transaction outputs, it's a collection of accounts. Uh, this looks a lot like your regular bank. So I have a uh, you know, savings account, checking account, etc. And I can transfer money between them, and I, when I do that, I subtract a sum from my checking account and increase the sum in my savings account and so on. So this is, UTXOs are a little unfamiliar to most people, but account models are exactly what you get with your bank or or credit card uh, company. Now, what does the Ethereum world uh, look like? Well, you know, we have a state of the world. And then something happens. We'll represent the state. A transaction happens, and that produces a new state. So this is like an automaton. So we begin with initial state. We have a transaction that creates a new state. Physically, the blockchain is this list of uh, states. Or it's a list of transactions. So, like I said, uh, the, a block is just a collection of uh, transactions which are dealt with, uh, which are batched together to make things uh, more, more efficient. And so the blockchain is just a chain of blocks. So this is what a blockchain looks like. It's a, the dotted line is the block. The transactions sit inside the block. And uh, they're all uh, linked with uh, pointers. They're also, everything is hashed to make it tamper-proof. You know, I talked a little bit about that yesterday. But this is the chain of blocks that constitutes a blockchain. Now you should be careful because other so-called blockchains don't have blocks or don't have chains. For example, the, you know, the Facebook Libra currency they call it a blockchain, but there are no blocks. It's individual transactions. It's not a chain. It's a, a Merkle tree. Uh, but they still call it a blockchain because otherwise no one would know what they were talking about. So, you know, one way of viewing the world is, is this chain of states. You know, the arrows go backwards in time because that's where the references go. So this is old, newer, newest. And there's, of course, a duality between states and transactions. The blockchain just has the transactions. The state is maintained by everyone who's interested in the blockchain. And everybody knows if you want to get the correct state, you replay the transactions. And if I trust you, then I'll borrow your state and not replay all those transactions, but only if I trust you. Now, the um, state of the world in, the, in Ethereum is just everything is an account. There are different kinds of accounts. Different accounts have different um, states. 
but everything is an account. So in more detail, uh, it's a map between account address and account state. So if I want to know what's the state of your account, you give me the address, I look it up. How do I tell what it is? Well, if I have a copy of the Ethereum state, it looks like this. If I don't have the state, then I go to the blockchain, I replay everything that happened, reconstruct the state, and then look things up. So one way to think about blockchains is it's an extremely inefficient uh, database. But it's a database that, that maps accounts to account states, and that's it. Now, one flavor of account is an external account, and that's a person. So I can ha create an account for myself. It's an external account, meaning that it's, uh, it's not a contract, it's not a bot, it's, it's me, or it's a company, it's an uh, organization, it's something in the real world. <coughs> is it controlled by private keys? A, an account is, you know, the account ID is, uh, I think it's the hash of the public key. And then the account owner has a private key that authorizes the account owner to spend money and do other things. Uh, there is a native currency called Ether, the analog of Bitcoin, and every person has an Ether balance. That's like the money in your bank account. So I could open an account and I could have 100 Ether in my account, which I'm authorized to spend if I prove I know the private key. And external accounts are active. So as a person, I can say, you know, send, send Petter some money. I can say, call a contract. Other accounts we'll see are passive. They respond to outside events, but they can't originate them. And uh, for our purposes, an external account, the address just maps to the balance. How much money do you have? Now, there's also a contract account. A contract is not a person. A contract is code and memory. It's like an object in a um, object-oriented programming language. So contracts can own money too. This is uh, the basis for escrow and all kinds of financial instruments. So money can belong to a person or an organization. It can also belong to a thing. So a contract can possess money. Contract has code the same way that an object has code. Uh, it's passive in the sense that I can call a contract and in response the contract can do something like send me money or call another contract, but a contract cannot spontaneously originate activities because a contract is not a, uh, a real person. And the code in a contract can transfer ether and call other contracts. And here we have a map between uh, address, uh, there's the account balance, there's the code, and local storage. So humans don't need code and storage because, because we have brains and uh, laptops, but, um, uh, but contracts uh, need those things. So if we want to run a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, the external party originates it, submits the uh, transaction, and one transaction you can do is you can say, create a new contract. So I can say, here is some code. Here are the original values for the variable. It's like a constructor in an object-oriented language. And say, create a contract. Give the contract an address. I can say, create a contract and give it uh, 50 ether of its own money. Create a contract with this much uh, memory. And you know, I have to provide the money, and I provide the code, and I uh, provide the uh, long-term uh, storage for, the, for that contract. <coughs> and what can I do with it? Well, I can call, you know, the contract exports methods, which are called functions. So I can call a contract's function. And that contract can do a computation. It can decide on the basis of the computation to transfer some of its money somewhere else. It can give it back to me. It can give it to another contract. And of course, calls can be nested. So I can call a contract which calls a nested contract. Again, it's just like an object-oriented uh, language, except with money. Uh, the um, principal, external contracts can send money directly to each other. 
So I can, if I know, I know Petter's uh, account, I can send him money directly. I don't need to run a contract. I can call, make a function call to a contract, and the contract will return a, a value to me. Uh, contracts can call each other. So it's a whole, you know, you can, you, you can see that you can build up arbitrary um, kinds of systems. And the log of everything that happened is the blockchain. That records the uh, calls, the outcome of the uh, computations, and so on. So again, there's this duality where the blockchain is the log of everything that happened, the, but you don't think about it in terms of the blockchain, you think about it in terms of the state. And the smart contracts are the objects and code that live in this world. And again, this is different from writing um, Python code because you're actually moving money around. You know, money is, in the form, in the form of ether, is an inherent part of this model. So that's why you know, they sometimes call this programmable uh, money. So the native currency called Ether, which has you know, a symbol that looks like that. Uh, Ether is not uh, this thing. You know, Ether is a, a currency like Bitcoin, which has a, a value on the, uh, on the market. I'm, I'm not sure what it is right now. It's a few hundred dollars. <coughs> now there's an important aspect of this that is, does not appear in your Python programs or your Java programs, which is the idea of gas. So how do you protect against the denial of service attack? You know, I'm a uh, bad person. I want to make life miserable. So I will create a contract that runs an infinite loop. And uh, that will prevent other people from getting work done. The way that you fix this is you charge for every step of a computation. And this is called uh, gas by analogy with the gasoline that we put in our cars. So if I want to, if I want to run an infinite, an infinite program, I have to give, I have to pay for it when I make the call. So when I make a function call, I also say, you know, here is, you know, one ether to uh, pay for executing this code. And if you run out of a uh, code, then it, it aborts the uh, computation. They keep your money, but they uh, roll back everything you did. So this is a protection against a denial of service attacks. So if you want to run a contract, you have to pay for it. So you can still do a denial of service attack, but it's expensive, and eventually you're going to run out of money. <coughs> so, <coughs> so each step of a contract has a fixed fee. So if I want to add two numbers, that's pretty cheap. If I want to compute a hash, that's more expensive. If I want to uh, make a remote call, that's, you know, that's even more expensive. And each time I make a call, I have to decide how much I'm willing to pay for it. So if I make a call and I give them too much money, I get a refund. If I make a call and I don't provide enough money, then I'm punished because I lose the money and the computation effectively never happens. Now, but the tricky thing here is gas is not ether. So the gas price of a, an operation is fixed, but the ether price of gas fluctuates. So if I'm running at four in the morning when nothing else is going on anywhere in the world, then gas is pretty cheap. But if there's some initial coin offering somewhere and there's a huge amount of contention and more transactions than we can put on the blockchain, then the price of gas goes up. Because the miners, uh, Ethereum has miners like Bitcoin. The miners are going, they, they, they're the ones who collect the gas. So if I say, here's a function call and I'm willing to pay uh, you know, one ether per each gas unit, and someone else says, here's a function call, I'm willing to pay a tenth of an ether, then whoever bids more gets priority. So if there's enough capacity, it doesn't matter. But if there is contention, then whoever pays more gets more. And so, so you have a fluctuating market in ether. And this makes life complicated. And it also opens up to all kinds of abuses. So if you bid, if, you, if you're willing to pay a low price, then you get low priority. And again, it might not matter if there's not much competition, but if there's a lot of competition, then you might have to wait a long time for your transaction to run. And of course, if a call runs out of gas, then your effects, the effects are discarded. Uh, your gas is not refunded. So uh, you better be, be careful. 
Uh, there are all, all kinds of attacks where you can trick someone into making a call that burns up their gas without realizing it. That's, that's one way to attack uh, uh, people. But I don't have time to talk about uh, all of these things. If a call has leftover gas, then it's refunded. So when you make a call, you say, what's the maximum amount of uh, gas that I'm, that I'm willing to spend? And you say, okay, so this is how much I'm willing to pay for gas. Here's how much gas I'm willing to burn up. And together, that, they, uh, t that tells you how much uh, you spend. You have to decide before you make the call, though. And again, this is something with no analogy in regular programming languages. Normally, when you make a call, you don't worry about how much money is going to come out of your pocket. Uh, there are some odd, funny things. So Bitcoin has a limit on block size. Uh, depending on which flavor of Bitcoin you use, it's one megabyte, two megabytes. Um, Ethereum has a limit on the amount of gas you can put in a block. So if, if gas price is high, then, then there's a small number of transactions. If it's low, they'll be, they'll be larger. Uh, but you can't uh, put transactions in that, that consume more than a certain amount of the gas. So when the transactions that you've accepted reach a certain gas limit, your, your block is full. And then it's time to, um, uh, to mine it. And in fact, this turned out to be not as good an idea as you might think. And I'll talk about how to exploit this to, to do mischief. So um, I'm going to sort of give you an overview of the information that everyone keeps track of. Don't worry about the details. Uh, it will be on the homework, but uh, you have plenty of time to look this up. But what I really want to do is kind of give you a high-level view of what information is tracked and what information is available for writing uh, contracts. So um, gas price, you know, how much the caller pays for gas is part of the transaction. Again, miners prioritize transactions that, uh, uh, that pay a lot. You know, the more you pay, the more they like you. Uh, miners collect the gas fee. And so, of course, you know, like I said, uh, you pay more, you get more. Uh, if you have an extra low price, you might never uh, uh, run. Uh, gas limit says this is the maximum amount I'm willing to spend. So you can say, I'm willing to spend a lot of money on gas, but I don't need much. Uh, I don't need to spend uh, much. Uh, if you, as I mentioned, if you exceed this, your call aborts. This is intended to protect against denial of service attacks. Uh, transaction sequence number is used uh, for technical reasons to avoid replay attacks. So every transaction has a, a unique sequence number. So I can tell what transaction I'm referring to. Uh, there's the destination address, to whom am I sending this transaction? So I might be, it might be a transaction where I'm sending money to another person, it might be a transaction where I'm calling a function exported by a, a smart contract. Uh, how much ether am I sending? This is different from the gas. This says if I'm transferring, uh, if I'm buying a pizza, this is the money that I send to the pizza store. Uh, there's data, if I'm making a call, if I'm calling a contract that computes the square root for some reason, this would be the, the argument. And there's all kinds of other technical things that we don't need to, to worry about, a lot of a crypto um, a stuff. So all of this is executed by an Ethereum virtual machine. And the Ethereum virtual machine, again, is a little bit like virtual machines for, you know, for Java or for other languages. But because it deals with money, it has to be somewhat different. And it has a kind of, again, I've returned to this theme where things in the Bitcoin world are kind of a distorted mirror image of familiar things. So this looks a little bit like a Java virtual machine, except it's, it's a little bit strange. So there's the code, uh, which, also, which is, lives on the blockchain. I can look at the blockchain and see every, line, every code ever executed by anybody. Uh, <coughs> Inside the execution engine, there's things like the program counter, uh, there's stack, there's the uh, gas available. Memory is a volatile heap. So when the call returns, the memory vanishes. And there's long-term storage. The storage also lives on the blockchain. So the, the storage, storage is forever. The storage doesn't physically live on the blockchain, it's reconstructed by replaying the transactions. 
but logically it lives on the blockchain because I can reconstruct the storage at any point in time from blockchain information. Uh, there are a bunch of operations. Uh, the virtual machine is a stack machine. Uh, there's no registers. You want to add things, you push them onto the stack. Uh, you know, the usual thing, you know, I push, push something onto the stack, push something else on the stack, add them, and the result is, is on the stack. Uh, there's control flow. I can jump from uh, one uh, place to another. I can call other contracts. I can call system libraries. Again, uh, what, you, what you would expect. Uh, there's lots of crypto hashes and things like that provided. They have to be provided as libraries because if you executed them directly, it would be much too expensive. There's a lot of computation that goes into these things, and if you did this on the stack, uh, nobody could afford to uh, do anything. There's environment, uh, the caller's address. Uh, how much ether do they have uh, left? Uh, what are you paying for gas? And you know, lots of other environmental um, information. Uh, there's, uh, you can load and store from non-stack memory, from the, from the volatile, volatile heap. There's information about the current block. Uh, you have the hashes of uh, recent blocks, but not every block. Uh, you have timestamps of uh, blocks. The time, block timestamp is basically just a, a counter, and, uh, and the block number, and, and more information. So one extent is, is kind of a vanilla you know, virtual machine. On the other extent, there's this gas, and it charges for everything that you do. Oh, you can write things to logs and uh, debug them and uh, communicate with the outside world and so on. So, um, computations happen on the, uh, on the stack. Uh, the stack has a bound. You deal with 256-bit uh, uh, words. Uh, memory, again, is a uh, volatile heap. You can uh, allocate things in memory. You don't need to do stack. Uh, memory grows, uh, but you pay for it. So if I want to allocate memory, then uh, that can be expensive. So that's kind of discouraged. Uh, storage is an interesting uh, uh, issue. Storage, remember, is a long-term, long-lived um, memory. So the people who designed this said, well, we need an incentive for people to release storage because otherwise it's going to live forever. And over the years, uh, it's going to accumulate with garbage we don't have a garbage collector. <coughs> so let's pay people to release memory. So what they say is, OK, if you release memory, we'll give you a gas refund. And uh, the way you free storage is you overwrite it with zeros. Because a virtual machine says, any memory that's totally zeros, we can forget about it. So when you're done with uh, uh, long-term storage, you can overwrite it with zeros. And um, you, you can destroy your contract. And, but it turned out they, they didn't quite think about this all the way through. And there were some unintended consequences. Now, typically, if you write a programming language runtime, you don't need to worry about all these kind of game theoretic things. But when you're dealing with money in an environment where nobody trusts anybody, uh, you have to be very, very careful about what you do. So um, it costs 5,000 gas to zero at a location. You know, don't worry about the actual numbers, worry about the relative numbers. 15,000 gas. If you do this, you get 15,000 gas added to your refund counter. So a refund counter is like a, a coupon as, as you're executing. You're spending gas on one side, but you have a refund counter on the other side. At the end of the transaction, you take the unused gas, and you take the refund count, what's the value of the refund counter, and you add that. So I free up memory, I get a certain amount of gas, up to uh, you know, half of uh, what I've uh, spent. So that's good. That says that um, I come in, I do something, I free up on memory, and I get back uh, gas. Now, anybody see a problem with this? Uh, that's true. You don't have money, but you can't. But, but suppose you do have money. So, so what? What? Uh, what are you? What do you? What? 
especially if you do it at different times. So you're paid in gas, but gas doesn't have a fixed value. So when gas is cheap, I can allocate when gas is cheap, and I can free when gas is expensive. Also, the memory that you're freeing doesn't have to be yours. I mean, you have to be authorized to do this, but you, do, you, know, you don't have to be the, the one who's authorized, who, who allocated it. So we have something called the gas token. So here the idea is that I'm going to write a contract. When gas is cheap, I'm going to go and allocate huge amounts of memory. Kind of the opposite of what we wanted. You know, Ethereum wants people to free up memory, but I'm just going to allocate lots of memory for no purpose whatsoever except to have it. When gas is cheap. So the token allocates memory or creates an empty contract. And then, so I create a contract that is authorized to free this, and I wait until gas is expensive, and then I'll sell it to you. So you really want to run a program with gas is expensive. I'll say, if you take this, you can take this contract and free up the memory that I gratuitously allocated, and you'll get a refund in expensive gas. So I paid cheap gas to allocate the memory. You're getting expensive gas to, to free it up. It, yeah, yeah. But notice that it, ha it means that you now have an incentive to allocate more memory than before instead of less. So when the gas prices climb, you buy gas tokens for, ga for storage that was allocated when gas was cheap. You send to the contract and you destroy it, and then you get a gas refund. So you pay in cheap gas, and you, you get back in expensive gas. And so that way you can get up to half of your costs uh, refunded. So this is kind of a classic example of how if you don't things, think things through in this area, people will exploit it. And again, people who do Java garbage collectors don't need to worry about this sort of thing. But this is something that you need to worry about uh, here. I talked to the person who invented this, who was who's a, re a professor, and he said, well, we did this on a National Science Foundation uh, grant, and so we created these gas contracts to prove our concept, and suddenly we made lots of money. And the one thing you should never do is, is accept government money for a grant and then turn a profit. Because then the question is, who does this money belong to? You know, he, obviously, he can't keep it himself because he'd go to jail. The university doesn't want it because that, that would, uh, you know, get them into trouble. The government has no idea what, uh, what any of this is. So, uh, you know, it, nobody knew what to, what to do with his money. And as far as I know, it's still sitting in a bank somewhere. Anyway, you know, th there's uh, uh, computations that show when, when this pays off. And so, is this, is this ethical? I mean, you know, somebody asked me uh, yesterday about the ethics. And uh, this is an area where most people seem to be totally unconcerned with ethics, but uh, let's ask anyway. Uh, so it means you, you allocate memory only for speculation, not for useful computation. You know, that's like polluting streams, it's, it's bad. Uh, that means that, uh, you know, things can be, uh, you know, underpriced. The gas token could drive up prices because suddenly there's more contention for memory, even though it's not needed for any otherwise legitimate purposes. And you know, the miners uh, might be worse off because they, don't, they get less money because you're getting a refund. You could say, well, it has positive effects uh, because it gives you kind of a gas banking service. It smooths pro uh, it's like buying futures or derivatives. It, just, it gives you guarantee that if the prices uh, go bad, you have some protection. And that has some uh, value. You know, the, these, these are kind of classical economic arguments. You know, it's a way of hedging against increases. You know, if I need to run a contract and the price goes up for some reason, it's not my uh, fault. I have some protection. <coughs> Give you some predictability. And so on. Let's see, 3.30, half an hour, right? 20 minutes. 25 minutes, okay. Okay, so um, I'll start on this, and maybe if I don't get through, then I'll, I'll resume uh, after the break. So... Now, I've talked a lot about the runtime system and so on, so now let's talk about the smart contracts. Now, um, to me, one of the most interesting things about this is that the language that was developed to write smart contracts by Ethereum, which is an extremely popular language, is probably like one of the worst languages ever invented for any purpose. It's basically it's based on JavaScript. 
Now, JavaScript is a perfectly good language for writing web pages, but web pages have the property that nobody cares if something goes slightly wrong with your web page. If you're moving billions of dollars worth of um, stuff and something goes slightly wrong, then people do care, it turns out. Okay, so a, this is a very simple example of a smart contract. Don't, work, don't squint you know, at the details, I'll, uh, I'll explain them. But an object, a, a contract looks like an object in an object-oriented programming language. So you have long live state. So this is a, uh, a mapping, you know, it's like a hash table. It maps addresses, addresses are addresses of accounts to, uh, to, to uh, votes. There's uh, <clears throat> the name of the voters is the name of the variable. The type is a mapping from address to, uh, to voter. And you declare these things. These are like the um, you know, public or private uh, fields of, of an object. A function is like a method. That's an externally callable um, a function, and those are the ways you manipulate state. You call a method. And contracts can call each other's methods, same way you know, objects can call each other. And um, now we get into concurrency. Now, if you look at the yellow paper that I showed you at the beginning, it says everything is single-threaded that uh, from the beginning of time to the end, there's only one uh, thread of control, so you don't need to worry about concurrency. Turns out this is a lie, and I'll show you exactly where, where the problem is. But uh, the I promise is that uh, we don't need to worry about concurrency in, in any kind of models or synchronization or anything like that, because things are single-threaded. Um, yeah, so contracts are executed sequentially by miners before consensus. So the miners pick up the transactions, they line them up in the block, they execute them sequentially from beginning to end, and then uh, they uh, you know, bless them and put them into the consensus machine. And if you want to check up and reconstruct the state, then you execute them again. But again, everything is you know, executed at one in time order, and there's no concurrency. So obviously there will be no problems. Now here is an application for smart contracts. So uh, DAO stands for a Decentralized Autonomous Organization. This is basically a hedge fund with no managers. So what happens is everybody who invests in this, they put their money in the form of Ether into a smart contract. and when they, deci they decide to take the money out to invest in other companies based on votes. So the smart contract basically manages the money, tallies up the votes, hands out the uh, money according to uh, whether enough uh, people vote. And the actual structure is kind of complicated, which I won't, won't really get into. But the idea is that the smart contract does all of the administrative work. If two-thirds of the investors vote to do something, the smart contract tallies it up and says, yep, that's okay, and uh, takes the money from the account. And, uh, and hands it to, uh, to, to the designated address. And so it was set up to invest in other businesses. It was initialized with about $50 million in capital, all, all in Ether. Sometimes you see 60, you know, sometimes. <clears throat> and the idea is that there's no managers or board of directors. It's all automated. And this is good because, you know, managers, board of directors could be you know, uh, uh, corrupted, intimidated, and so on, but smart contracts um, will always do the right thing. And so it's a combination of investor voting and smart contracts that manage the, um, manage everything. And uh, the kind of the ideology behind this is to say, well, code is law. Uh, the reason they call these contracts is because the code that, the code determines what happens. The code can't be influenced. Uh, we don't need governments, courts, police, regulators, any of that stuff because we have the code will decide what happens. And we can all read the code and we all understand what the code does. And uh, therefore, this is kind of a libertarian paradise where we can uh, you know, manage, all of, manage all of our financial um, interactions without parasites uh, who uh, demand you know, money to, be, to administer uh, things. And when this came out, there was a lot of you know, hyperventilation. 
you know, the press was very excited about this. And they said, oh, that's great, all these Wall Street uh, parasites will be driving Ubers, or you know, I guess Yandex, uh, now because uh, we're going to put them out of work with these smart contracts. And, you know, these are some of the, um, some of the press that came out when this uh, first happened. Now, um, let's walk through a piece of a code from, from this contract. Uh, this is, is not literally the code that they executed, but it's almost the same. It's slightly simplified. So that green arrow is the program counter. This is a function that says that where an investor can ask for their own money back. So I put in 100 Ether. I decide I need to take it out. I call this function to get my money back. So the argument is how much money? So this says which client? Message.sender is the address of the client. <clears throat> Does the client have enough money? So the uh, balance is a mapping that says the maps client address to how much money they have. And it says, yes, they have enough money. Okay, then this says, I'm going to transfer the money by calling a function in another, um, in another contract. So this is how you transfer money. You know, you call a, a contract and say, uh, here's the... Uh, here's, here, Here's your money. So in some sense, unless you're familiar with this, this probably looks fine, but already we have a problem. So what happens when you execute this code? That's what happens. So let's go back over and look at those steps a little bit more carefully. What did we miss? So let's rewind. Okay, so here we are, we're about to send money to the client by calling their function. So the program counter goes down, and this is the client's function. This is the send money a function. And the client says, okay, thank you for the money, I'm gonna credit my account. And then it does something strange. So it turns around and it calls its own caller back right away. So it goes back and it calls withdraw one more time. And so now the program counter comes back up here. Now notice at this point we have two program counters executing the same code over the same memory. Which is kind of alarming because uh, you told me that there was no concurrency going on here. And what is concurrency if not having multiple program counters executing the same, over the same code in the same memory? The fact that one of them is uh, you know, active and the other is suspended uh, doesn't matter. It's still multiple program counters executing code on the same object. And all that means every synchronization nightmare you ever heard of su suddenly was, it not only becomes possible, it was possible all, all along. And people didn't realize this. So what happens? So you get down here and you say, does the client have enough money? What's the answer? The answer is yes, because we didn't, haven't decremented from the first one. You know, we don't decrement until the call returns, but the call ha never returns. It makes, the, uh, it makes a re-entering call. So there's always enough money. And so then what happens is it sends the money again. And again and again, until finally there's a stack overflow. But that money is still sent. Stack overflow doesn't undo the, uh, undo the effects. And this happened. You know, almost literally what I showed you actually happened. And suddenly the tone of the uh, press changed. Right, so here, uh, you know, 60 million, 50 million, uh, who knows. But, uh, you know, the, this person drained the money out. They couldn't get the money because there was something saying that things are locked up for 60 days before you can actually with, withdraw the money. And, <clears throat> in fact, Nobody ever figured out who did this. Uh, nobody figured, you know, the people who stole this money, I think, never managed to get a hold of it. But there's a theory that what they did was they weren't really interested in stealing the money. What they did was they shorted the Ether currency. And by doing this, of course, the value of Ether dropped. And so if that's true, they probably made a lot of money legitimately by, by shorting the currency, and they didn't need to do anything dangerous like try to actually uh, take this money out. I don't know. 
So what they did, people were very alarmed by this, so they went through and they basically hard forked the currency and started over. They said, okay, well, if you had made a mistake and lost $50 million of your money, that's tough. Code is law. But you steal $50 million of my money, we change the rules. Now, I'm not saying this is the wrong thing to do. People get very angry if you suggest this is the wrong thing to do. I'm, I'm going to be agnostic about whether this is, um, was you know, just or, or not. You know, there, one argument is that, well, this was a bug that nobody knew about in Ether, and uh, therefore, uh, you know, it's fair to uh, roll things back. You know, but, but basically, you know, code is not law. You know, code is only law, again, if you lose your own money, but if you, lo if you steal money from uh, you know, the people who actually control the uh, uh, wheels, then uh, you know, code is not law. So uh, we can argue about this, but most of the people said, oh, this reentrancy attack just shows how weird and strange the um, blockchain world is. Uh, but being a uh, kind of, but it turns out that in my concurrent programming class, in, you know, th there's copies of my book floating around here, there's a place in there where we talk about exactly this bug. But we don't call it a reentrancy attack, it's called a monitor invariant violation. And in fact, this is something that's been known since the 1970s. If you have a monitor, a monitor is, the, is basically a locked piece of code. If you decide to release the lock, you have to restore the invariant before you release the lock. And making a nested call is basically you're releasing the lock so another thread can come in with the reentering call, but you don't restore the invariant, which is that your variables reflect how much money you actually have. So this is one of the oldest bugs in the book, but because the names were changed and because the people who did this didn't buy my book, uh, you know, they lost $60 million. So, uh, you know, make your own conclusions about this. Uh, Okay, so um, this is my last slide, and then I'll talk about something else after the, after the break. So uh, one of the, you know, like I said, one of the reasons that this is such a uh, fascinating field is because unlike the kind of drier technical areas that I usually work in, this is something where people are full of passion about, you know, reforming society and uh, making uh, the world a, a better place or a worse place or something. And so, well, you have to, you know, one side says, well, cryptocurrencies are great because of censorship resistance. No government, no corporation, uh, no organization can, t can prevent us from transacting, from transacting with one another. We don't have to trust anybody. You know, who knows who can be corrupted or intimidated or so on. We have all these algorithms that guarantee that uh, we don't need to trust any particular individual. And in particular, we don't need... We can build a libertarian society with no police or courts or anything because code is law. Not, you know, law isn't law, code is law. Now, a more cynical point of view is that, well, actually, you know, it would be fine if, co if we could write correct code, but we still can't write correct code. And if code is law, you better be prepared for things like reentrancy attacks and uh, things like that. You know, designing a language where reentrancy attacks were even possible is a little, uh, you know, seems like a poor uh, choice from, from my point of view. But, you know, again, that's my opinion, and there are people, like I said, who will get very angry uh, when, when you say this. Okay, so uh, after the break, I'm going to talk about doing um, cross-chain transactions. So in the future, everybody will have their own blockchain but we'll need to be able to trade Bitcoin for Ether and things like that. So we need transactions that span multiple blockchains. And what I'm going to argue is that our traditional notion of distributed transactions and databases and so on don't work in a world where uh, we don't trust each other. Instead, we need a lot more game theory and, and things like that. So I'll uh, talk about that in, uh, I guess, Half an hour. Okay, thanks. <laughs>